Certainly, it's nice to Oh, here he goes. Here's the man he can tell you himself. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, sorry. Traveling from uh, country to country was not so difficult, but then the last bit, suddenly a huge amount of traffic. So uh, I apologize. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, I see Spencer is here, who will be uh, regaling us with the presentation today. I also see another new face, Roderick. Um, hi, Roderick. Um, glad you're here. Thank we're, you. We're waiting for a few more people, but should we do some basic introductions maybe to start with? I'm just going to clean my screen as well. Maybe, Spencer, you go last because you will have the longest introduction. Sure. So maybe, uh, yeah, Roderick, if you could say a word or two about yourself. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Roderick Kennedy, I, um, I I founded a company called uh, Simul. We, uh, we're working on a, um, it, it's, it's an established company, but we're working on a um, VR, AR, network protocol, um, a, a real-time protocol um, for, for VR. And uh, I'm, uh, I, I guess I'm very interested in uh, the philosophical aspects of, 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 of what we're trying to do and what it means, because um, if, 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 if we're to get it right, I think a certain amount of um, vision of, of where it's going is, is necessary so I am um, that's that's where where I'm at with uh, with with what we're doing and why I'm here <laughs> yeah I got your email and replied incredibly late so um <clears throat> sorry about that no worries on uh, on that note as I emailed to some of the group today uh, I am working on this whole uh VR AR along with everyone else here but the more, oh, we can do that, and oh, it should, that should happen, the more it becomes clear that infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. So I'm working on a very different infrastructure from what you're doing, which is fantastic to have um, the slow time and the real time and the same dialogue time. Um, so let's see, randomly on the screen here, Fabian, pretty much everyone knows you. Uh, maybe Roderick doesn't. Um, Please introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. So my name is Fabien, Fabien Benetou. I'm based in uh, Brussels, Belgium. Uh, and basically, I'm here because first, I think text is important in any form, shape or form even. And also because I'm struggling with it. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, like eating device, paper, posters, uh, and I want to have posters everywhere around me and I want those posters to be computational notebooks and I want to invite you there and yeah so I'm trying to build all this kind of uh, all little pieces and there none of it works because I'm a prototypist so I don't make products I don't know how to do this I don't know how to make something that lasts more than a day let's say uh, but I have a lot of fun trying to do this and I'm, I'm learning uh, with the discussions here a little bit uh, here and there, uh, either inspiration or new ways to, to consider that. Uh, and uh, for, let's say, during weekdays, I work as a prototypist at the European Parliament, uh, where there is an innovation lab. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, Mark. So Mark, Bob, Jim, and then we go to Spencer and start. I expect Brandel will be here and a few other people, but... Okay, so hi, I'm Mark Anderson, based uh, in Portsmouth uh, in South England. Um, I've been doing basically hypertext since the 90s, hypertext in one form or another. So hypertext and metadata, I got very involved in image metadata when that started at the end of the 90s and spent a while in sort of doing effectively uh, image data and really have been an information emergency plumber for a long time, moving stuff that's supposed that you can't move between things without without dropping anything on the floor. Um, so unsurprisingly, my interest probably as much as is metadata and indeed the, the thing that I'm currently looking at within the group is the is the reality um, beneath the idea of just using image maps. For instance, you know, when we take complex diagrams 
into VR and we want to interact with them, how do we how do we do that? And how do we do that using the available sort of um, standards and protocols? And of course, it turns out rather as Fred has alluded to, to be a bit more simple than just making image maps. You know, so you know, which, which bits travel along with a document, which bits are dereferenced, all that kind of thing. Anyway, that's probably enough to start with, and I'll pass on to the next person. Um, Jim, since you're visible. Oh no, Bob's okay. Jim, go ahead, and then Bob. Go ahead, Jim. And you can do it with sound if you prefer, but you know, if you want to do it mime style, that's cool too. Forgetful Jim is my nickname. I am the least oriented to AR and VR. My focus is on trying to make text much more useful from a reader point of view, as opposed to an author point of view, where I think a lot of formatting is neglected and shouldn't be. Uh, at the same time, I'm also extremely interested in the kind of visual inframural work that Bob Horn has done. He and I have become friends. Uh, and I think those two interests really merge. So I've been fascinated to hear the conversations in these discussions because they tell me that a lot's happening in the world that I don't know much about, but need to learn about. Sounds perfect. Uh, Hi. Sorry, got my, my my ear things got out. Um, I'm Bob Horn. Uh, I li uh, live in San Francisco. Uh, got interested in this uh, back in 1985 or six, something like that. My, I was a friend of Doug Engelbart's and uh, wrote a book called Mapping Hypertext, um, which uh, came out before the World Wide Web did. Um, and uh, since then, I've been very interested in visual, in, in the integration of text and visual elements. Think of them as very big diagrams um, and uh, like wall size di diagrams uh, that have hundreds of text elements, chunks of text on them and hundreds of visual elements on them. Uh, <sighs> More, uh, more you can find out from me uh, uh, or uh, at bobhorn.us. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, we're 10 past. I think that's gonna be it for now. So Spencer, this um, group, the mess, everything is recorded for the monthly presentations, including yours. It's recorded, transcribed and put in our journal and then it will go into the Future of Text Volume 3. And this year we're having our annual symposium on the 27th and 28th of September in London. Both Spencer and you, Roderick, you're both very welcome to attend physically, virtually, whatever. If you can make it virtually, please tell me, no, excuse me, physically, because we're still dealing, we've finally managed to get a good venue, but now we're trying to figure out the the um, the food and the coffee, it's actually tricky. We're going to be hosting it. 99% sure we'll be hosting it at the Linnaean Society. How cool is that? Yeah. That's really cool, right? Uh, no smile from Brussels, Fabian. Yes. So serious. Uh, so sad. I saw a Jared Lanier talk where he, he had a bunch of slides and he like flew through them. And then, and then he got the last slide, he took a deep breath and he pulled up a bassoon. He played like a concerto. Uh, it sounds like a pretty fun time. Yeah, it can be. Uh, it can be colorful. That's that's for sure. So Spencer, um, I know nothing about you. The only reason you're here and talking is I completely trust Fabian. If he says someone's brilliant, someone's brilliant. So I'm very excited to hear who you are and what you'll be talking about. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have a, a presentation. I may need to. Uh... Um, restart the thing, sorry. Um, I'm Spencer Kelly. I'm the author of, of Compromise. Um, it's a, a natural language, oh, sorry. Um, I'm just gonna rejoin the um, the meeting. I have to do the Zoom update. Okay, yeah, that's the way Zoom is right now. Yeah, Zoom's gotten a bit uh, rich like that. Uh, Roderick, where are you physically? Liverpool, UK. Okay, so I'm further north than you then for once. I'm in Bergen, Norway today. Uh, will you come down for the symposium, maybe? 
Would love to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let, let's keep in touch. Um, all right, there we go. Yeah, we can see your screen, Spencer. This is all good. Um, so in, in 2015, I... Um... Uh, hang on, but, but before you continue, the way we're viewing it, there's quite a lot of gray space on either side because uh, mm. you have a very wide screen. Do you think you can somehow make it a bit bigger? Of course. Thank you. Is that all right? Yeah. Now we can even read it. <laughs> Fun. Um, um, so I'm Spencer Kelly. Um, I have no background in linguistics, or or I'm a sort of a crappy web developer. Um, in 2015, I made this library called Compromise um, that does um, some natural language processing tasks, but it does them in the browser. Um, and in 2016, it, it made like Hacker News and stuff. Um, since then, I've been kind of um, just doing it full time. Um, we just had our hundredth release, um, and it's not the um, it's not the most clever or the fastest or the most accurate um, library, but it is the smallest. Um, um, so I'm going to talk about sort of the ways that we've made it made it tiny. Um, it's not sort of a fun constraint to operate under, where you have to have um, you're trying to classify a language or or words, but you have to make it really tiny um, to fit in a web page. Um, that's that. And the basic philosophy of the idea is that, that it's really easy to write a part of speech tagger if you're okay with having 80% accuracy, um, which is really low. You know, like some of these conferences, people compete about like 34.5, 34. It, it, it's like um, um, what I keep finding though over and over, um, just whenever I talk to people, is that um, being able to reach in and like hack the parser or, or, or configure it or change it um, um, is a huge thing for people. Um, and you can't do that in a neural net, or you can't do that in a lot of um, um, things. So, so that's that's the approach, and um, and it keeps it keeps on uh, rolling. You know, the project. I had no idea this was going to be sort of my career and things, um, but that's how it's come for me. Um, um, in web development, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the web. Um, I think it's like our our one pure um, um, platform for for communication and knowledge. Um, and one of the reasons I think that it's, it's been so successful is that it's in small file sizes, you know? Um, there's no, no loading bars on the web. And, and so, so a lot of good develop, web developers work tooth and nail to shave off, you know, a kilobyte or so. Um, compromise, there's different forms of it, but, but they usually settle around 200 kilobytes, which is a nice size because that's where uh, jQuery was in its heyday. You know, um, and people complain about the file size of that, but they kept using it. Um, so I'm happy with with that sort of file size. I'm happy with the speed, um, and it can't grow much much more than that in my opinion. Um, so this is this is where it's at. This is sort of a silly demo, but we can conjugate verbs and stuff. This this demo is um, uh, turning the tense of the sentence into past tense. Um, it's sort of silly, but but you can see the the appeal when your parser is in JavaScript and in your uh, your application is running in JavaScript. It's like it's like right on your fingers, you know. Um, you can you can play with it, your tags. Um, same thing with number parsing. No, I'm not sure. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened to the demo here, but it, it's it's pretty simple as well. Just to um, just to to scan the text for numbers, classify them, interpret them. You can see that we even like inflect the noun uh, when it gets to one, so forth. Um, date parsing too is great. Um, this is like my favorite task in the world. Um, but it's working working pretty well at this point. But by far the, the most important part of the project um, that we've had is just this: it's the really simple match template uh, syntax. Um, I know there's a similar one with Spacey and the Stanford Tagger and all of this, but um, but over and over, people just it's like you can see their their eyes light up when they realize they can just like write basic templates for for words and grammar, you know. And we support the kind of regular expression type of you know greedy matches and stuff like this. But um, this is it, you know, th this is the center of it. And, and you know, like English majors can write templates and things like this. Um, I've seen projects where people push this really far. Um, uh, sort of the, the chatbot uh, trend that happened a couple of years ago was really driven by this sort of thing. Um, yeah, is there any questions? Can I pause it? Um, I just... Yes, I, I have a question. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, it would be helpful for you to describe it from the standpoint of a of an ordinary user. 
um, like me. I don't know what, what, what would I want? What am I trying to do? Am I searching a whole bunch of text? Number one, if the answer is yes, then uh, I'm typing in something and, uh, and it will find it in the, it will find it in the text. Is that what you can do? Right. Yeah, it's, um, that's a great question. And, and, and the reason why I, I think I'm sort of always confused and always, always uh, curious about this project is that it, there's so many different, different ways. It's like a, a general um, tool, a JavaScript tool for um, parsing text and turning it into data kind of. So, so you see people using it for search, like you mentioned, or, or for typing interfaces. Um, probably the biggest um, um, use case for this sort of thing has been in like text analysis, you know, like um, it's used in a lot of like, like law applications. Um, I'm working with a medical application where, where it's like you're, um, you're disambiguating text uh, the joke that we have at the job is um, um, in a medical sense, the word discharge means a bunch of different things. So, so being able to determine which uh, use of discharge. Um, so, so there's some like um, grammar analysis, but, but really it's, it's open-ended. Um, so people have used it for a lot of different things. Okay, thank you. So basically, um, Sorry, can I just yeah, just please. a second to to go back on uh, Bob's question? Arguably, the for example, the, the usage uh, would not be for you directly, but for uh, a software developer in the middle that would adapt a piece of software uh, or a web page or something in between. Let's say the final user. The final user would not necessarily be a developer, but somebody. Um, that needs to process text, uh, and eventually, then you, the final user, would would be able to to use it. But it's let's say there is a developer in the middle kind of layer, uh, as it as it's a library, a software library. Yeah, that's right. It, it's it's not a product um, at all. But um, um, sometimes you, you hear the metaphor of like a uh, a cook where they have a bunch of recipes, and so so this would be like. Um, I'm an ingredient that people can use, um, a plug and play kind of library. You talked about, I, I think you talked a little bit about natural uh, language. And um, does that mean that also going to your very first slide, does that mean that this is something that me as a developer, I could potentially use so that if someone searches for the name of a person, it also shows instances where it is using her or she but grammatically, it clearly relates to that person. Yes, yeah. On the the anaphore resolution is one of the things that, that we do. Uh, there's like um, uh, subject predicate analysis of sentences and like uh, nonverb stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll get to that maybe in, in a couple slides. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it was just in relation to what Bob was talking about, and that is um, th the power here is is, is clearly immense. But yes, the different people will tool it in different way for different uses. So yes, please continue. Um, so they, um, um, when I started, or the way I was sort of hoping to frame the conversation is that that I've I've begun um, thinking about the problem in a completely different way, and and it's a little bit sloppy in my head. So I, um, when I was invited to talk here with a bunch of smart people, I was hoping that um, we could sort of uh, try to think about um, uh, solving this in a better way um but but how it works right now is that we just have a big lexicon of words we just generate them you know um on the left we have a bunch of infinitive verbs and then we conjugate all the forms you know um, um we try to make it as big as, as possible this blue line is the um zip field distribution of words so the idea is that if you get to a thousand words it's like 80 percent coverage but um but we're like you know in the, in the 99 98 99.999 uh, uh, percentage of so the lexicon is really big and we do that using conjugation um what's amazing um which uh i find just peculiar um is that the whole thing ends up being around 30 kilobytes which in context you know if you have a startup and you have a web page 
and you have a background image on your web page, that's like two megabytes, right? It's like, um, this is all the words you're ever going to hear in your entire life. Like if you had a, a um, microphone on your ear that counted words from the time you're born to the time you die, like all of that can fit into this very, very small amount of data. Um, the way we do it is using a prefix try, which I know there's um, some some degrees of, of engineering in the room, but like but basically if you have a bunch of words with a redundant prefix, cat, car, cartoon, we only need to store the word, the letter CA once and we just pack it down. Um, so, so we've been using prefix tries um, really heavily in the project to get things down um, and then and then conjugating the list once we have them to make it as big as possible. Um, is there any, is this a good point to, uh, um, is there any questions? Don't, don't worry, we are very good at being rude and <laughs> So feel free to go on. I'm, um, I'm just feeling very pleasant uh, looking at this, it's a different angle than what we usually look at. It's very powerful. It's very useful. It's very well presented. So please just take your time. And I'm sure people will start screaming without a question or comment. Thank you. Yeah. And I encourage the screaming um, at all times. Um, I've, been, I've been thinking about um, instead of a prefix tree, um, suffix tries. It, so, so it's the same thing, but uh, working from the end of the word backwards. Um, and it's it's really unintuitive for English speakers or people who speak um, left to right languages, um, because it's really hard to to imagine in your head. Um, but the idea is the same, where you you work from the from the right to the left. And it, and the reason why I think it's better is that if you think about a word, you know, um, this part on the left is like an ID. You know, it's like a um, it's something we've all just memorized. Walk, W A L K. It's just a, a thing. But the, the part on the end is, is like a redundant pattern that we all apply using, using grammar. Um, so it may be way more effective uh, going from that end. So I've been thinking a lot about suffixes um, to, I should say, um, in, in Italian or Russian or, or many of these uh, languages, there's like way more conjugation that happens um, when there's you know, gender that apply to verbs and adjectives and and case and all that. Um, so it it seems to be the same for all Roman languages where the suffix is just this like uh, a generated pattern. Um, it, it's like low in information as opposed to the start of the word. So what I've been thinking about is instead of storing a list of words in a lexicon, do we even need the the left hand? Like, can we start can we start shaving off words? Just keeping the suffix um, as a classifier. So, so we want to know that these things are nouns, these things are verbs, etc. But maybe like penser sounds like a noun. So does answer. So does mm, sir. Um, like how much can we get away with with actually just making it smaller and smaller and smaller? Um, this is this is just a list of suffixes. Um, that I made up. So, so answer the only result is Spencer um, in terms of some with some thresholds. And same with N C E R. These are all nouns. At, at least they seem to be nouns. Um, it gets a little bit more confusing with this one though, where we have a lot of nouns, but we also have nicer, which is not a noun. So the basic idea is this, where um, I've been trying to slim down this word model using suffixes, um, and some of them are noisier than others. Um, like like some are high signal, and these ones are high signal, but are also have noise in them. So so I sort of the setting threshold, and then um, it, and it's the same thing too. If you have the word, if you have the suffix n c e r, you don't need these other ones because um, they're redundant too. So I've been trying um, all, all winter, basically, all summer, I've, I've been sort of sitting down with a coffee and trying to do this project. And, and every time I do it, I, I um, end up with a completely different result. You know, I can't sort of get my hands on the problem. Um, one of the reasons why 
is is this is that this suffix even though it's really clean um it only applies to three of these words but this one even though it's a bit noisier um it's stronger so there's sort of like a, a trade-off you know it in terms of machine learning problems it's like a messy one um and I can't sort of get it. So I, so I know this is a really specific problem, but um, uh, that's where I'm at um, in terms of building this project. Um, this, is, this is a printout of Wikipedia. We, we think about um, language as a huge, huge thing, but, but in fact, it, it can um, be really compressed. And so, so what I was hoping to talk about is like how, how small can we make this word model? It, it, um, what's the previous work? Uh, um, what are some suggestions for making this uh, more efficient? Mm. Yeah, go ahead. The, the compression is, um, hi Brendel. The, the compression is a bit out of left field for me, something completely new. So in trying to understand it and looking at different aspects, can you talk some more and maybe show some more about the transformations you can do? Because the example I used earlier of select the name and do search, and it also finds instances where the name isn't mentioned, but grammatically clearly is, which is such a classic example. If you can talk about a few things like that, that may be useful. What was that? What was that example? Was that a... Uh... An example, you go, you're reading War and Peace and you come across a name and you do uh, find based on that name, but it also finds any sentences where grammatically, let's say it's a woman, it says she or her, because you know it refers to that name, but that name isn't there in that sentence. That's uh, an interesting transformation, but are there other kind of analysis or transformations like that that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of work with, with um, translation and conjugation. Um, um, and it's the same thing where, where it's like uh, um, root words or or, 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 or lemmatized words, for example. Um, it really means the same thing. I saw this incredible graphic. I, I should find it um, where it was comparing, um, say, a, a word with a sentence written in Spanish and a sentence written in English, and then it would connect with lines, which of the words meant the same thing. And, and it's amazing. You know, I wish I had that resource when I'm trying to learn a language. Um, just how just how it's the same thing. It's like, oh. yeah. That that leads to a, a question. Um, many many years ago, with um, a friend in, we were sitting in a cafe in Croatia. I'm just trying to contextualize for myself. Sorry about all the unnecessary information. And one of the things we thought about was having a summary of a document, but not for the reader, but for the writer. But the key part of the summary is that. When you look at the summary, if there's something that is incorrect, meaning that you as an author has written something, the summary didn't understand the way you meant, you could click on that part and it would expand to show you what part of the summary was used to create that part. Does that make sense? Yeah, you you pulled in, in parts of like um, phrases from different sentences and compiled yeah. them into one. Because when you talk like about the, the corresponding lines, Right. Because you know you you've written a big heavy paper, you get it, get the summaries like no, that is not what I'm trying to say. Click on it. Oh, I need to change these bits. Does that fit within what you're looking at? Well, that kind of sounds like back propagation error correction. Um, uh, if you had the ability to um to quantify the extent to which the specific uh, components of the final answer are incorrect. Then you can uh, then you can tweak the the weights of the original <laughs> summary at some level, but it doesn't work uh, linguistically in the same way that it works numerically. Um, I think uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I was sort of I jumped in pretty late, uh, Spencer, but I was really interesting to hear your sort of emphasis on compression. <clears throat> I've I've lost the reference, but there's there was a really interesting uh, essay, I believe, by some head of department of artificial intelligence or other in the in the past. Um, saying that compression and artificial intelligence are the same goal, that having some kind of semantic and representational kind of uh, distillation of uh, a set of information is equivalent to getting your hands around it um, in, in terms of what its actual informational content is. And I think that's a really interesting point is that when you can reduce the sort of the space that that 
information takes up, then it, it intrinsically means that you need to understand it. Um, and so I, I think that's an interesting sort of component of that goal of compression for its own sake is it's not, it, that's good, compressing is fun, but also it, it means that you have a representation that has some salience and, and some power for a prediction as well. Yeah, I think I, uh, I'm, it sounds like I'm more of a skeptic of the of the neural net solutions than, than you are, Brendan. But um, um, my understanding is that is that even if you have the most impressive um, deep learning neural net, it's like and it and it's looking for patterns. The the patterns that it will find are just like rule based, small, uh, little things that that um, that would fit in a small data set. You know, like, e like even if the weights are are terabytes. Um, that's my I, I agree with your idea. Oh, I, I, I'm not. I'm not an, an, uh, a neural net uh, subsymbolic advocate. I was just talking about the, the premise of of back propagation. Um, yeah. Well, the, the, certainly there. I mean, there's there's the case of overtraining. You know, a linear regression model when it's been over applied to a specific data set will always give you the best possible results. But as soon as it sees something out of set, that's something that's been sort of part of statistical analysis since before it was called anything fancier than that. Um, yeah. I have a question, if if I may. Um, I I was I was just um the wondering the idea of um the uh the the lines between say an English and and the Spanish um translation of of, of the same sentence um is I mean first of all is is your implementation focused on English or is it is it multilingual. There, um, it is focused on English, and I've I made some forks for French, Spanish, German. Um, I mean, I, I was I was just wondering, would it would it be possible to have an abstract representation of text that was language independent in some way that uh, from from that you could um, you could extract a. a the, the sort of meta text, and then there would be a map from that to to English, to Spanish, and so on. And perhaps the meta text itself could be compressed, um, in in the sense that, say, that there's there's only one number that represents the verb to run, um, etc. Or could it could it be done in that way? Yeah, my understanding is that um, with translation, or that's, um, I hate this word, but but that is like the naive um, first take on translation is that it's like word to word. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at actual translations of what people do in like the United Nations, is they they'll like throw phrases all around. You know, they it's it's very very rarely word to word. Um, um, but yes, I agree with you that that grammar is structured. You know, like. Um, there's actually rules that we follow when we communicate, and 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 it infuriates me that that it's so hard to parse that. Um, um, and our 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 ways of parsing text that sort of pretend that there are no rules, you know, are are missing the point because um, there's knowledge in a sentence, and we need to get at it. So that's so yeah, um, that would be a dream uh, being able to do like like an abstract syntax tree for for uh, multi-language senses. I mean, it's the it's the only thing I, I do know about his, his um, academic work, but uh, um, the, the link, oh, who, who's the ultra political linguist? I've forgotten his name. Chomsky. Chomsky. Chomsky, yeah. Yes, um, uh, the only thing that I know about is his work is this idea of uh, a sort of abstract underpinning of, of, all, of all language that I don't know how far you've, you've looked into that. Um, yeah, is there any... Um, that wasn't a question, it was just... <laughs> um, that, that, that's just what it uh, reminded me. Yeah. I'm, I've got one. I, I noticed you, you, you can't, as unsurprisingly, of course, uh, there's a much better data underlying corpus for English than there is for other languages. So apart from, and it's interesting you saying, you know, that there seems to be a commonality in many of the uh, sort of Roman Latin based languages where the endings are 
more similar than you might immediately imagine just from sort of the looking of them. Um, so the language may appear separate, but structurally they're often quite similar. So what, um, is there a sort of a, a, a standard source um, across all languages in a sense? So I don't know what your, the corpus that you take to, tr to train up or your, you know, your stemming and your lamentization and everything. Um, is that consistent across languages or do you have to actually go for each language that you really want to get involved in and hunt for the best corpus? Yeah, it is. Uh, um, my background is, is from, from web development and, and there we have this you know, Stack Overflow community where we're all you know, throwing code around and sharing and helping. It, it's so frustrating in, in the linguistics or even computer linguistics communities where where people will write a paper and say, oh, I have this great data set. And then you email them like, oh, cool, can I see? <laughs> you know, it, it, um, there's not a community of, of sharing and it's really bad um, and, and the world would work so much better if there was. Uh, but but in terms of like a one one, one solution, I um, but there are some tools where it's like, like if you have, if you have two um, sets, if you have a list of word pairs and you wanna conjugate one to the other, you can just throw them in a, as a list and then machine learn the suffixes. Like um, if you have ing verbs and you want to translate them to it, just like you remove the ing or if it's like pp ing or whatever. Um, it, it, it's all like it's not a, uh, it's just this list of transformations, you know. Um, it strikes me as you, so I, I mean, it does make me wonder. You know, for some, it's certainly in some of the more developed um, or you know more, more affluent nations, is that something where effectively the countries, as it were, almost as the owners of their language, ought to maybe put some some power behind this sharing? Because you're absolutely right. Unless you know a lot of the a lot of the really rapid takeoff, you know, of the sort of web and things is because people just shared stuff. They just drove straight past all the boundaries. Not always correctly, but you know, <laughs> some good things came out of it as well. And and so perhaps problem, you know, that's probably a, a, a short sightedness, but or an inadvertent short sightedness of some some um, linguistic communities or some language communities, should I say, that they're maybe one of the best things they can do is pump some money into just developing a really big corpus, because my presumption is that you know, to a certain extent, part of the, part of the thing is having that big enough training set, for want a better word. Because the, the the tools that you're using broadly, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, map across. Part of the problem is the tools are no use unless they've got enough data to work across. Is that right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I completely. It, um, I'm even further, like primary education, for example, um, or or ESL. You know, we're teaching half the half the planet all these insane, like uh, nonsensical rules, uh, um, and it's just brutal to to see somebody learning language. Um, um, it would be so helpful if, um, not to change the language, not to like police the language, but like um, to have have um, tools to better understand uh, what, what what are the rules and what are the exceptions and, and so forth. Because one interesting that came, and uh, last point, and I'll see someone, it, it came out for actually from reading David Bellos's book was the fact that actually there are there are quite a small number of hinge languages. So actually, you very rarely go across every possible transformation that's available across the set from language A to language B, you normally hinge through another, which unsurprisingly English is one of those. Um, and it's partly due to the number of native speakers or, or native speakers or, or good quality speakers of both languages. But, um, and that, that might, again, might be another sort of um, institutional hinge that could be uh, lent on. Um, Fabian, oh, sorry, Fred has signed up as well. No, uh, Fabian, please go ahead first. Yeah, it's um, actually on, <laughs> Uh, I'm not a teacher, uh, and I hated grammar lessons when I was at school, uh, but I do think it matters. But I think, yeah, those lessons are probably uh, just wrong. And uh, and one of the first thought I had when I tried um, an LP compromise library, uh, and actually some of the example you've shown today with uh, selecting an object, for example, the date or an hour, and then being able to move it around and see it reflect live on the text. Um, that that made me think also about this. Like, you can imagine uh, somebody doesn't have to be a child. Anybody trying to learn a language, um, and there is, yeah. Usually, you you build the vocabulary relatively easily over time, as long as you're interested in a topic. But grammars, all those rules, and and how it impacts everything, 
that's really the most fun. But uh, whenever something is not that fun, having some immediate feedback uh, can be quite helpful and also being playful. So some of the examples with widgets you've shown, uh, and we can imagine, let's say, um, speech to text uh, or some ways to make it so that somebody speaks in front of a computer uh, and then interact with the text uh, in a playful manner. And then, yes, can play some translation, uh, I mean, transformation rather from one type of sentence to another. Uh, I think this this kind of way to to be playful with the content, with the text, to learn the grammar itself from a human being perspective uh, could be quite powerful. It's definitely something that I'll explore. This may be a stereotype. I'm, I'm from Canada, and my understanding is that it, in Europe, like um, grammar is taught, if people know what a infinitive verb or a superlative or something is, um, it, and I've had that explained for some of the reasons why Canadians and Americans have trouble learning languages is that they were never taught grammar. You know, it's just like a, in the air uh, when you're learning words. Oh, I would. Um hesitate to to support that assertion coming from Norway uh, growing up in Singapore and England I can tell you what a noun and a verb is that's it you know and the way that I I have a five-year-old beautiful amazing baby boy and you know he's English growing up in England when he does the wrong kind of sentence you know I just say oh another way to say that is this right I, I don't tell him well you could do the you know to the structure of grammar is, of course, very, very important. There's no question, but obviously grammar means different things in different contexts. For instance, the transcript from this conversation will have very bad grammar because spoken English is, of course, very different from written English. A lot of words will be missing. Uh, the odd pauses will be there. So this is, yeah, um, that, that, that that's a huge thing and language evolves. But in the beginning of your presentation, you showed so many uses of this i would really like to see some more in addition to my find example you know you show changing the dates changing the numbers and stuff um obviously I, what software were you using was this one of those uh, jupyter notebook type things or what environment did you do those interactions in to show us um it's all javascript um the 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 parsing is all javascript so so um uh -huh. can, we go, yeah. can we go back to those slides and talk about them a bit sure not not really slides but you know, your interactive javascript presentation pages how's that yeah i can this is the main website for the project um you can see that we have some some demos here um like this one is is a date parsing where it's like uh oh that looks like a bug Uh, um, so you can see that it, it, it tries its best to to interpret the um, the meaning behind the date. Um, that's that's used in some places. This is just a, a part of speech, um, basically where you can see that the, the noun phrase is um, interpret is uh, split up by the verb phrases. Um, yeah. Um, the cool thing about but web development is that it's so um, easy, or or it's so uh, sloppy, or 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 even crappy. If you if you'll uh, allow me, it, like um, it's so easy just to uh, prototype um, things, and some of these you know barely work, um, like the syllable parsing one, for example, is nice. Um, things like that. But there's a bunch on the website if you wanted to look around. Um, I can go back to the, the demos if you wanted. Well, okay. One of the use cases we have in our community, uh, which is, um, oh yeah, hang on. Let me just pause immediately. Uh, Roderick's uh, comment there. The, the coloring is something that Doug Engelbart was uh, excited about for a while. Um, so how, what, what are the, the rules for coloring in, in this environment that you're using now? Why are certain words certain colors? Um, yeah, I can pull up the. Um, is it based on grammar or types of words or what? Yeah, types of words. Um, the the types of words that we support. There's some 200 of them. Um, 
and they're arranged in a tree where where noun is the root of the tree, but like a person's name would be also a noun. Um, so it supports all sorts of things, you know, like uh, organizations and conjunctions and things like this. Yeah, and so the colors are arbitrary. It, there's no uh, no uh, special thing for the colors. Then I have um, a very specific question for you, uh, which is um, uh, I have two pieces of software, author and reader. Uh, author for making documents, of course, and reader is a PDF viewer. Uh, could I potentially license or something some of this for the reader part? Because um, uh, are you uh, have you been told anything about Visual Meta? Um, it, well, hey, it's free. It's completely free. It's okay. an open source library. You're you're free to um, do anything you want. Change it, move it. Uh, there's no no licensing at all. Um, so of course. Uh, well, that, that would be an interesting specific use thing, as if Fabian has his hand up. But thinking about Jim, uh, what he said earlier about helping people read, thinking about what this is, and thinking about Visual Meta. Can I share screen just for a second? Yeah. Okay, so the, the color thing is really interesting. So let's, um, I'm going to take this introduction document export that to PDF, and I'm exporting it now. So everyone on the call pretty much knows what this is, but the point is, this is a normal PDF, but it has, all the headings are known to the document because of this visual meta. The visual meta at the end of the document says what the document is. One of the things is who wrote it. So you can see in the uh, BibTech format, authors, my name, title is all of that stuff. But then, and this is why I got excited by what you showed, because we also have the headings. So you can always fold the document. So one of the things we can do now in, um, oops, in Reader already, we um, have the basic parsing for names. So you see here, it's grayed out the headings and is showing the names of the different, whatever name is in a different section, right? Cool. So what I think, I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, because we have that uh, metadata stored in there, the headings and so on, um, that really alleviates the issue with PDF, that PDF is complete crap, you know, in terms of structure. So we can't do much. But with the kind of things you have here, it will be an interesting test bed to allow people to, you know, I, I even saw you had male and female names. So that could be for whatever type of reading you're doing to build up a library, some kind of a plugin structure. So that the end user can have a little thing of, I'm interested in being seeing the difference between this and that and whatever. It's really fascinating. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I just I, I wish um all all authors had the same uh, care for metadata as we do in this in this group. Uh, um, I would love to see all the all the names written in a in a book or something like that. Yeah, I mean the names are just normal text. The only thing that Visual Meta has is headings and a few things. We should have metadata here. Um, by the way, I don't know if all of you saw, but I did a um, a document of this talking about the importance of metadata um, and Visual Meta. Sent it to Vint back and forth. We had a few discussions. He's now sent it to John Warnock, including the video walkthrough. So if John gives us a bit of a thumbs up, um, then the chances of Visual Meta being able to be more appreciated by the PDF community will be vastly increased, of course. And, um, you know, metadata enables clever stuff. It isn't clever by itself, but um, I, I'd love to hear more ideas that you have for dreams for how someone could come along like Jim and say, this is just a bunch, sorry, Jim, I'm reading a bit into your words here, but this is just a bunch of great text. How can I make it come more alive and be more visual so that it suits my personal reading style to find out my personal interests? Yeah. Yes. I, um, Tell me sure. about your magic documents that you want to make happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's there's the reading side and then there's the writing side. And I yeah. find uh, um, um, there are a bunch of... Um, some of the applications of both of them are kind of infuriating, you know, like like maybe we haven't sort of cracked on that yet. Um, with with typing interfaces, often people have drop downs or 
or things get in the way when your cursor jumps around and stuff. And and I find that that, that interface pretty frustrating. But with the reading thing, um, yeah, like um, as long as it's done really well, like styling of text, um, there's been a bunch of um, work recently for, um, sorry, what's the condition when you, um, when you read words backwards or dyslexia? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, for dyslexic reading interfaces where it's like uh, the syllables get chopped up in some ways. Uh, um, but no, I don't have any um, any good ideas to be perfectly honest about. It. Yeah, oh, go ahead. I, I have one uh, related to, to the dyslexia. So uh, with coloring, for example, you can use a, a various varying degrees of signposting with various degrees of intensity to sort of pull apart text and make sure that it's parsable. You know, one of the more heavy handed ones, um, and you, you may be familiar, uh, Spencer, with um, visual syntactic text formatting. Everybody on the call knows how much I love that. Um, but, you know, color coding different uh, different word types and things can be valuable. Um, but it might be onerous for people to um, to need to opt to do that, not, not, not to say uh, embarrassing. But uh, something that I was watching in the uh, proceedings of the Augmented Humans Conference recently was using um, functional near infrared spectroscopy for um, measuring blood flow or front across the, the, the front of the brain uh, and using that as a map of how motion sick they were. But uh, it's, it's actually a proxy for how hard people are having to concentrate. So if you find that word phrases are, are, are too difficult to concentrate on, then you could start ap applying increasingly more aggressive ways of pairing it apart for the benefit of um, for the benefit uh, of people being able to parse it at a sort of a, uh, at a continuous level of, uh, of perceptual difficulty. Anyway, I see that everybody has their hands up and I jumped. There, there, are, there are lots of hands up, but just I think we should, I hope you guys have written notes on what you want to say, because the notion of what you were doing, you know, like Brett Victor has done all kinds of cool things you click, cool and useful. But I think what is different with what you're doing now is I can take it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, and people like me, I have, I am a visual snob. I want it to look like this, this, and this. But Jim may not want it to look like this, this, and this. So to be able to work uh, and also to think of uh, ways to do it and in terms of the authoring process, you know, I just did my thesis, which is a little bit longer than I would normally like to write. So just imagine a thing where it constantly analyzes the document. And if I write a sentence that's similar to something I've written before, maybe it goes red. You know, I click on it, it says, you've actually written something similar here. You know, that will be useful. Or if I write a sentence and I'm not sure what to do, that, you know, hit a question mark and it can say, based on what you've written, you know, this is what relates to that. There are so many things. So I'm wondering a little bit about how this can be put together, because just like Bob and Jim, I'm also not a programmer. You know, I have to work with programmers. So I think I can represent a middleman kind of a guy where if you can present it in a modular fashion, you know, we can at the bigger community can say, you know, plug in, have fun, so to speak. Yeah, it may be the case that um, um not just tech, technical solutions like it um going back to the like the mental tax um um like this is what they kind of teach you in in um writing school if if you want to be a, a in, in like if you want to be an english major or something they teach you how to how to write sentences that are like a like you mentioned not repeating in the same same template or or um just easy to read, you know, like it gets the point across. So, so maybe in, in sort of a depressing way, we're just sort of circling back towards like teaching how to write really well. I don't think that's depressing. I think that's super important. <laughs> but yeah, I, I could go on forever. And um, uh, Fabian, please. And then Roderick, I think this the order I have on my screen. Yeah, um, I wanted to go back a little bit on the the question i think it was for mark about um the coloring um and it's an example i i shared uh, last week as i was i was reading an article uh, on chinese propaganda through uh, documentary film festivals uh, and it was starting to be relatively complex with a uh, different uh, organization places etc and i wanted to basically transform the text to a graph like who are the different actors uh, that are participate to that network and who drives it and i have to visualize it so that's that's one of the motivation i had for playing with a 
an LP compromise. Uh, and, and I think that's the same way that I find uh, grammar can be challenging. It's, it's extremely powerful, but it's also so abstract. Like when you see, I don't know, uh, hashtag P for a pronoun or NP or all this, when you're not in it, it sounds not only complex, but also pointless. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think once you do get it, then it's like you have new affordances with text, something that was basically read only until that point. And then you can play with it and add scale. So it's really powerful. But the first steps I find really hard. So I think that, and it's tricky because one of the way to make it less hard or more motivating, let's say, to go through those abstractions is the examples you shared. When you see the widget and you see people, uh, yeah, you you change the the dates and whatnot. And the problem is when you do this, then people ask, "But can you do X Y Z?" And then you go down. It's like, oh, it's actually just a visual filter, let's say, or a mapping between a word and or a type of word rather, uh, uh, and uh, a color or some visual way to represent it. But it's when you go deeper, it's so much more powerful than this. But yeah, navigating efficiently through level of abstractions or even knowing that it is an abstraction and indeed behind if you understand it you can play however you want with it i find it um quite challenging uh so yeah that's that's pretty tricky um and, and one little point uh i mentioned in the chat that uh, the example you give with the widget to change the number let's say a, a full text number to digits uh, to me, that's especially exciting because I, I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, have you tried VR at all? Yeah. yeah, I got one of those upstairs too. Okay, and, and you tried the browser in it? No. So I'm glad that I asked. <laughs> uh, it has a web browser, like a stock browser, uh, and you can just make a web page uh, in JavaScript. You can just open it and then it's going to be immersive. So there are frameworks to do 3D, like 3GS uh, or Babylon GS or whatever. Uh, and it, I think that I'm really glad I asked the question because that's, in my opinion, the intersection of uh, our world uh, and language and text and how to, again, give an affordance to it. So you can imagine uh, having the text displayed there, but instead of moving the widget with your mouse, uh, you just grab it and then move it to say, okay, one, a number, uh, and that number, let's say three rabbits, when you move it up, then you have actually like 3D models of the three rabbits that become four, the text itself that matches it. So it's something that is uh, with your skill set as a web developer, you can do today. Like you don't have to be a, a Unity or a game developer to do it. Whatever you'll do will be ugly uh, at first, but it's definitely feasible. And I think that's when, again, it becomes interesting. We can have uh, observable, so let's say some notebooks that you play on the desktop, uh, and then a link between both, let's say a data set, uh, and then in the headset, you just make the text maybe not tangible, but at least uh, natural ish affordances uh, to it. Are there, uh, besides the number interaction, are there other, have you been thinking about other um, other interfaces? Um, so I'll send a link in the chat, but one of the things I uh, personally like to play with is uh, also instead of having code floating, let's say, in the air, uh, code snippets. Uh, the same way you have cells, like in Observable, uh, you can also have a code snippet directly in the immersive world in the browser of your headset. And then you can pitch in it to execute it. Uh, it's, yeah, what, whatever is on your mind or things like, I don't know if you're familiar with Scratch, uh, where you have like this kind of block-based programming. Right. And then the, the grammar uh, is represented by the shape of the block. Um, so also, I think this kind of model is quite powerful. Uh, so you represent, right now, for example, we do HTML function that applies, uh, let's say, a visual transformation uh, to the text. You could imagine having uh, a visually significant, let's say, I don't know if you can put, maybe you can, I don't know in English, but let's imagine you can't put four verbs one after the other. Uh, then you would imagine that after the third verb, it would make a non-snappable block or something like this. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the concern, like, uh, I'm every talk, everyone talks about Clippy. 
being like the um it's like it was wrong or it was like nagging or it was it, it, there's something about that interaction that that um discouraged people or or didn't understand what you're doing or something um so it's it's sort of a dangerous thing uh well, for, for Clippy specifically, I I would argue maybe there is a bit of anthropomorphization that makes the person feel right. judged. But if it's a non-human or entity-looking block that, yeah, you can't snap it, you can't snap it, I think most people would not feel too bad about it. And then if you can unfold it, say, okay, the rule behind this is because of this, if you can basically backtrack. But I'm just speculating there. I haven't tried that to the level of uh, text, for example, and a and in a headset with a grammar, but I think yeah, the the, the principle you have now uh, could be transformed not just to um, to change the and and also just for the anecdote, there is a on top of three GS uh, there is a A frame which basically have the HTML like uh, property, so it means you could have uh, you can probably just directly transform. Uh, a paragraph as a text on a web page to an a frame page that would load in 3d and thus in vr and thus trans and also apply the same transformation to either change the color of the text or make this kind of uh, add some properties behind it let's say the uh, uh, noun or pronoun or whatever and then visualize it so i think it the going from what will you already have to a grass bubble uh, interaction model in VR is probably relatively straightforward uh, without touching anything of what you've already built. Just using it basically should do. Cool. Um, so yeah, I th there's just a fascinating um, possibilities uh, and, and then the, the idea of the transformations um, uh, sort of jumped out at me, the idea that maybe you could change the tense of a novel that you don't like or uh, change it from the first, I'm, I'm not a fan of first person narrative so much in novels, I, I'd love to sort of read it from the third person um, or track the actions of a character. Um, or maybe it would allow us all to read Proust uh, and those three three page sentences um, a little bit more easily. But uh, one of the problems with with that and, and a little bit of a brick wall is that uh, Amazon has more or less a, a monopoly on on the ebook market, and it's all locked down with the digital rights management. Um, uh, Corey Doctorow speaks a lot about this. And, and about how harmful it is. Um, it's, you could make some amazing tools, um, but so much of the text is is out of reach. But I think it's great that you're doing things in an open way and making it freely available. Um, the other great use that uh, I could imagine for, for my personal benefit would be to syntax highlight um, academic documents, which, I, I often find them very, very difficult to get through. Um, and that's one where I think that maybe it's a little bit more possible because most of them do come in PDF form and anyone can write a PDF uh, reader um, because, because that's a, a, an, an open standard. Um, so, I mean, I, I, there's, there's just so many, so many um, possibilities. I wonder, Spencer, what, what are you thinking of doing with this? Um, what, where, where do you want to take it? Yeah, sometimes in, in um, I like your example. I'm sometimes in a in a really long sci-fi book. At the front of it, you'll have like, this family belongs to this clan, or whatever. It's like a mapping, or you'll have a um, <laughs> imagine that for an academic paper, where it's like, oh, lactobacillus is a bacteria, or whatever. That'd be a dream. It's like this is a little bit of what I think we were we were promised um, with with hypertext, and it's not it's not quite there because of uh, well, a Amazon controls the e-reader market, and uh, the the um, academic publishing market is 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 also controlled by a few um, big big players, and, and that's that's getting in our way a little bit.
Right. Um, yeah, a couple of things. I, I, I did, as Fred asked, put something back earlier. I think is if there aren't colour conventions, maybe the answer is um, the time has come to not waste ask for permission, but to start, you know, in the community, putting something together. Because if nothing else, it'll force somebody to come out of the woodwork and say, no, no, we've decided this already and here, here it is. Um, there's obviously one of the things we are, you know, that will limit us because things like color blindness is something, you know, and, and the, as the infographic community has sort of found is we can't necessarily easily, easily use the full palette, but certainly having conventions, I think would help massively in the way that people have already mentioned about learning something. So part of the learning is okay, you know, this color is broadly this thing. And it can be a loose affiliation, but again, it doesn't overtax the learner. I haven't got to remember what it is, but I know in this context, this thing means this sort of thing. And that, that I think that helps learning. Um, I, I, I was also um, was just wondering, and I'll sort of nerdy have text on that, is, is how problematic it is actually interacting with text in um, PDFs, which do horrible things to text because it was designed as an end format for print. It was never designed really for digital text use it's just what we've got and it doesn't seem that it doesn't seem that things like the latex community who produce a lot of um uh pdfs have any interest whatsoever in producing text that's fit for digital life rather than be printed on page ironically but that seems to be where their head is at so and i bet things like ligatures uh, and, and you know hyphenation um do you find those problematic to consume yeah i'm not a programmer uh, so i don't know but i mean good. <laughs> um, uh, I I am a uh, real words with the Unicorn cons Consortium. Uh, um, I feel like they've introduced bugs into every programming language um, based on, uh, on some of the sneaky stuff where you where you can add characters together and and um, invisible characters and things like this. Um, it's really really hard, and that's just that's just in web. Um, I'm not an expert in PF by any means, uh, but it's it's really hard. Yeah, and, and the uh, a couple of things that just brought up by listening to um, uh, Roderick was a sort of when he's saying, you know, actually having some colouring or some hinting onto sort of syntax, it, it strikes me, I mean, people are sort of doing this, especially this medical community are doing stuff with structured abstracts. So maybe this is an area where we need to double down on, on just that sort of structure. And, you know, part of the way is that the gatekeepers, which are the journals, just say, you know, get on the, you know, to get on the ride, you've got to be this tall, you need to do this. I, I don't think it's hard. People, people don't do it because they don't have to, and it's one more thing to do, but broadly, it's not onerous to do, because if you're in a field, you should understand that structure anyway. So as long as people don't make it difficult to annotate the structure, then that, that's there. And just another thought, uh, with passing reference to hypertext. I mean, one of the challenges, I think, in the early days was, you know, people bounce backwards and forwards between interconnecting everything, uh, you know, ha having a sense of too much and not enough. Um, and, but I think happily we we've, we've got past that stage because the the uh, state to which sort of web based tools have matured is there are lots of ways in which effectively we can have a sort of just in time enrichment. So in other words, the, the, the possibility to have thing can be there. And indeed, funnily enough, this was done in early pre-web hypertech systems, microcosm being case in point. And it's all sitting there in the long grass waiting to be recovered. Right. Yeah, I mean, lots of exciting things. When it comes to the, the color, uh, there is, of course, a reason to say you wouldn't want to have color all the time. I mean, programming environments may benefit for that, but when you're writing, you want to be able to toggle on and off. One of the ideas from uh, quite a while ago I thought about was when you are scrolling a document, what does that mean? It means you want to find something else. That's what it means. So then it should not just take the same stuff and move it up and down. It should know that. So for instance, if you have brand names that is in your document, replace the brand names with logos, but only at the point of scrolling. Maybe it should remove text that is redundant to leave only keywords. So when you, as long as your mouse is still in the movement phase, it can be still, but you've started moving. So you can go through, so you can collapse. Maybe that's when you have can have um, uh, a color coming in and, um, and so on. But these uh, transformations are, you know, we're talking here about VR, very, very interesting, especially when it comes to the record of dialogue of a group, because there are many interesting data points and what you're doing makes more. There's, of course, the people in the community, 
there's the time of day. Uh, some of these things are fixed, which is good. There are links. Um, Brendel has made an amazing visualization of one chat, which he turned into basically a magic carpet, which on 2D is nice, but in VR becomes interrogable, so to speak. So I'm wondering if um, it might be a challenge. I know we've only known each other for an hour and 12 minutes, but it's, it could be fun maybe for the next future of text if we could think of a way to take this explicitly text manipulation approach and find a way that it has a beneficial use in VR and not just a large monitor, but a few things that could happen. It could be like Jim is interested in augmenting reading. It could be a war and peace for the sake of argument. It could be our own record. It could be something else. But what are the thoughts we could do? I mean, one of the, the amazing things is you come across the numbers like we talked about, and it's written 12. For you then to be able to say something like, show me every sentence in this document that has a number. That in itself is valuable. It can find out anything that has a date or a time attached to it, roughly try to put it on a timeline. That's valuable. I did that for, I think it was Emily Bronte's one of Wuthering Heights. You know, you do it manually as a student, it's fun. But it seems with this kind of analysis, some of these things can be done. Um, I have talked a lot, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts as to a, a, a rich thing that you've seen within what you're working on, but that you can't really get out because of the constraints in your environment, maybe. Um, I, I love your example with chat. Um, I think it's one, that's one of the few, um, like the command line is something everybody loves and we keep using just because it's magic somehow but but i think chat is something that's uh, just where it's like your your partner's on the left and you're on the right and, and your words go up um it's, it's like really working people really love it people really get it you know um, um it doesn't matter if you're whatever age or or, or technical capacity it's, it just works and you, and you um scroll the chronology um but those are all closed um if that, was, if that was your question, like uh, there's no way to parse uh, my message text or anything like that. A chat, a link to a video you can see of the uh, magic carpet. Yeah, I, I'll take that as another opportunity to plug um, uh, web VR like Fabian. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a big, big fan of it. Um, another really interesting thing that w I hopefully will be of interest to you is that um, you actually have the ability to use full hand tracking, um, which means that you have not just sort of X, Y, Z of your of a, of a specific pinch point per hand, which would be good enough, but you also have um, the full 27 degrees of freedom of each individual finger curl that can be used to uh, as a way of semantically identifying different sort of actions. And so instead of picking tools, you can just move your hand into different shapes and use those as effectively the keystrokes, except they're not they're just floating in the air. And I, I think that's really interesting. It sort of feels that much more like magic. Um, something that I've been really interested in trying to do in the past is, uh, you know, maps, uh, physical geospatial, uh, maps of physical geospatial places um, support themselves as their own level of detail. You know, you can zoom in at, into Toronto and you can see certain landmarks and you pull out and you see the Great Lakes. Um, the, uh, but text doesn't have that ability, particularly. We don't have the ability to see the sort of a level of detail that's appropriate uh, because you can look at zooming user interfaces and have a, a literal view of that. And if you have things separated by chapter and you happen to know that Genesis is that much longer than Exodus, um, then then that means that renders it recognizable, but you don't get a sense of uh, one, any of the other important sort of components of what is significant about this set of, uh, um, Bible. it's not that a Bible is especially important, but just, uh, I remembered by because I was reading the lolcat translation recently. Um, but yeah, like they, they are they're very different uh, in, in in character in a number of other ways, and we don't have the ability to kind of inspect and scrutinize those on the basis of having only the the raw text and the raw glyphs available. Uh, and so uh, I, I would be really interested in using uh, this as a mechanism for being able to generate LODs, levels of detail of uh, different corpuses so that you can zoom out and see what is different about them. It strikes me, though, that there are differences 
in the way that different texts are different at different places, if that sort of makes sense to many uses of different, because some things change chronologically. You have a document that follows the same characters over time. And so it's not significant that it's this character and then it's also this character and then it's also this character. But what perhaps might change is the, is the location or the time. And whereas you might have something which is dealing with different characters in the same place. And, uh, and so you need to make some degree of judgment about what it is that varies over the course of a document in order to be able to, to, to extract what are the, the salient sort of features to amplify and elevate for the purposes of that. Is that something that you've seen people play with or do you have any advice for how to approach things with that? How would you feel like what you've built would be able to support that effort? Yeah, the, um... And the, the use case that comes to mind is, is like with news with news articles sometimes they they really um it's really important that they count words in their this piece needs to be 500 words or, or whatever um um yeah it, the the folding unfolding example i saw in the chat it that'd be that'd be lovely if you could go into greater detail with with like especially timely events that are happening right now go into more detail um, that would be incredible okay so here i have a question uh, actually it I'm not sure if we're in the middle of something, are we or not? Okay, so the question is this. I sent this document to Vint Cerf to send to John Warnock, clearly important for me. The point was, how in the world can I get John Warnock to read my stupid writing? So I had to be very careful with headings, bold. I had to do everything I could to make it as readable as possible. I even did a video of the document so how can we theoretically uh, help an author do more than just layout and colors but actually put cleverness into their own document so that it becomes easier more glanceable and more possible for deep reading and more compelling for the audience so it doesn't have any more than a few minutes because they're most likely busy what magic dust can we allow the author to sprinkle in You first, Spencer. No way. Maybe I'm the guest speaker. You first, and then plug in. <laughs> you first. No, I don't know. I, I, um, I, I think that the magic of text is is something that um, uh, that we lose sometimes when we add more interactions and hover states and and things like this. And uh, I really don't know. Well, okay, just before Fabian hops in, the, the kind of things I'm thinking about is things like stretch text, an old hypertext thing where you write a thing and you have an icon, and if people want to know more about the thing, they click on it, and they can expand and more text appears, right? I'm thinking about um, Mark Anderson made me <clears throat> put into our PDF reader that if you click on a citation that's in a numbered form, it will then show you all the reference information. You know, th these are really hidden interactions until you want them. So I'm wondering, we even have a glossary system in Visual Meadow. So for instance, in the document I sent to Warnock, of course, he will know Doug Engelbart. But if he happens to select Doug Engelbart, do command F to find references to it, it'll give the glossary definition on top of the screen. It's just, you know, I've done these things, I'm very happy with it, but you have another level of intelligence for these things that's really worthwhile. For instance, um, you know, Apple has data detectors. If there's a date, for instance, you can click to add it to calendar. But what if in a document that I author, I write, <clears throat> on the 27th of September, we will hold the future text. But when you open that document and it knows that date has passed, yeah. it changes it. You know, then it will be something like we plan to hold. And then maybe there could be an embedded link that could go live at a certain date. Maybe depending on, you know, you're reading a news article and, you know, right now we're in economic and all kinds of turmoils. If a company is doing really badly, maybe the color is going red, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit silly here, but, what, what, you know, when someone opens up, how can it be personalized for them? Okay, I, unless you have something, Spencer, I go over to Fabian. Go ahead, Fabian. Did you, 
it, it going to be a little bit awkward because I'm going to points. say the opposite of uh, our uh, guests, but uh, it's okay. I, I do think actually more interaction is better, uh, but maybe finding the right one that is relevant for the reader. Uh, so for example, it doesn't, most of us, I guess, don't think about it as an interaction. But if I take a big document, uh, to me, that's a kind of interaction having a, a table of content that allow me to jump to the place I want to. Uh, it's not linear, like you break the linearity of the text. So it's a invention at the very least. And I think that's more like that. That's the kind of iterate uh, interaction uh, that is very valuable, but it has to be not interaction to be flashy and, and do something for the sake of interaction, but it helps usually for me as a reader, what I want is novel information that's meaningful to the goal at hand. Like whatever I'm reading is what is actually something new. If it's not new, I don't want to read it. Like if I know it about it already. Uh, and if it's irrelevant to the task at hand, if I have the time or if it's for pleasure, yes. If I have a problem to solve, is it relevant to that problem? And I think whatever kind of interaction that will help that, um, yeah, to, to me, that, that would be pretty powerful. I don't have an answer to what that would be. I don't know if, let's say, um, being able to better control the, the, yeah, some new translation within the text would help there. Uh, or, yeah, finding structure, grammatical structure in the text would not. Uh, definitely the, the kind of... Uh, dynamicity about uh, a date is an interesting example um, and, and it, I think it's a good example in terms of making it relevant for me as a reader like maybe the event is past and then yeah it's not not that interesting anymore um, but it's really reader dependent let's say so that's why I would tend to think making it more of a, maybe there is a default value or default interaction but still more of a toolbox is more demanding for the reader if you read for pleasure then you just go with the flow if you read for a process or solving a problem then you're actually not attacking the text but remolding it for your goal uh, and i'm not sure exactly what kind of interaction that would be but I, i'm <laughs> my intuition is more interactions <laughs> Fantastic. Over to Mark Anderson, Portsmouth, UK. Hi. Um, I just just a, a thought. Uh, so listening to the discussion of having you know much uh, sort of documents are much more uh, structured and revealed structure it makes me wonder whether we need to be bolder about stepping away from uh, our laudable attempts to hold on to legacy structures. And I wonder if we're a bit afraid from walking away from past intellectual pretensions. So there's an awful lot you know said about narrative and. It's amazing when you try and talk about sort of things like documentation versus a novel. People will say, "Oh, yes, but it's all still a story." And I think, I think we actually need to unspool that and say, uh, you know, to what extent are we just holding on to the, the sidebar and we're afraid to swim out to see what happens? Because I, th I think maybe we need to be bolder and say, "Well, okay, if we're if we're going to have some of this richer writing, we we actually need to think from the get go how that informs how we write." Because I don't think it's going to write, it's going to be the same as we're trained to do when I was in my youth was or fountain pen and you know my awful scratchy handwriting going across the page, um, because everything we've talked about comes from a very different place. So it comes from an understanding of the available metadata, or, or whether you have it or that which you might need to use, the effectively the frame in which you want to do to allow you to leverage all these wonderful things that are going to help either help you as the writer or help you as the reader. Anyway, just a, just a thought. So it's this, this thing about, you know, are we actually involved in a bit too much rear view thinking? Um, and the other sort of quick reflection was thinking back to the early question of Spencer, you know, in the sense of, well, what does it do? I can say, I feel your pain in that. I mean, I, for 14 years, I've documented something that happens to me. It's an application rather than a, a library, but it's a, it's a tool for thinking and annotation. And the question everybody asks is, what do I do with it? And the answer is, what are you trying to do? <laughs> because it's a tool set. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a generic thing. And I think it makes, it makes me ponder on this other problem that we're actually remarkably bad about engaging with tool sets like that because we come to it. We want to be told what to do with it. Now, if it's actually quite open and exploratory, well, the answer is you can do bloody anything with it. But we don't because we want to know what it's for. 
we assume it has a a, a primary or a limited purpose so again i i don't know how we break out of that that sort of rather um narrow thinking but that's you know another thing we probably have to move beyond yeah fair enough um randall um i wanted to take a run at how do you get john warnock to read your writing um and one of the things that i find uh improves my writing is to think about it more one of the ways that i think about my writing more is by having people ask sometimes annoying but lots of introspective questions about what the writing is is and it's doing what the point of it is and what the main point of it is and so anything that allows somebody to recycle over their words and their intent and the imagined sort of context in which somebody is going to consume that in i think is a, a valuable uh, process um and that's normally in the form of a real flesh and blood human being off of my spouse or some of my friends who who have the patience and tolerance for reading my writing but uh, i would be curious as to whether um a, a digital system whether sort of explicitly presented as agentive or not um would have the ability to kind of stir me to actually think about what it is that i'm writing you know i it was really funny so like i work um i work at apple and my um my current manager used to be the manager for mail so she actually was the one who wrote mail and and the team and so i asked her like have we ever written stuff that helps you write a good email huh. and um no not really like there's spelling and grammar check as sort of default components of it but i would wager that most people who have gotten to a leadership position within a technology career have a, have a sense of what makes a good email and yet nobody's ever it's not not really occurred to anybody to put that into something like mail um you know this technically the ability for a, a plugin architecture to be able to support it so that that question can be punted down the road somewhere but i just like i think that writing good writing deserves uh deliberation and and uh sort of recovering the same ground of figuring out what it is that the writing will actually do um something i did a real a while ago was a um and a a mobile preview of a of a website and rather than just having it um as a um in sort of locked up in the size of a phone what i did is uh using that library 3js that i mentioned um put it onto a, a physical phone in a 3d world so that you could see not just that it's going to go on a phone but that phone is going to be in a world uh, and i didn't get to this point but i i thought it would be really fun to also put it on a phone as somebody is crossing a road with traffic so that you can think about what are the likely distractors what is the context in which somebody's going to reside so um you know to back to the question of how do you get john to read your email um is uh think about what the email is doing think about what john's doing and think about what uh, are the things that you can kind of bring to the fore and in what order uh, in order to make sure that they are sort of attuned to the to the sort of the hierarchy of informational needs that somebody like Warnock needs to be able to kind of get that and uh, in so far as these digital tools can support that it would be whatever um helps sort of bring those things to mind for you within the the process of constructing that as a piece of communication i think that this is so perfectly mentioned in here so but i mentioned sitting in croatia I was sitting with my friend timur who is uh, in current situation fortunately russian i say unfortunately because he feels very stuck in russia i wish wish he could come here uh, one of the ideas we talked about and spencer this may actually for once be right up your street and that was the idea that when you write something let's say that you are an academic or a student or something like that on export it does a whole bunch of analysis of your document it does the grammar check it does the reading level check uh, it checks if you have enough citations a whole laundry list of checks and then including the kind of checks um, that um, brandel was talking about such as um does what what kind of things and does it you know basically all the magic sauce as well pour as much sauce as you can on it have check boxes for what you care about so that's cool but the other half of this is when a teacher or other academic reader opens a pdf let's pretend the world is still pdf they run exactly the same suite of tests 
So if a student or a writer hasn't been bothered and they open this document and it has the, you know, it's like you have cited two contradictory sources. Uh, the grammar level is just awful. Look at this score you have. And you keep referring to this person as a woman when she's a man, whatever it might be. That teacher can then save so much time by just clicking a button saying, send back with this analysis result. Right? That can go for basic reviewers too. So many people have to go through basic stuff. So therefore, I have the question for you within the area of um, the kind of stuff Brandel was talking about and I'm talking about now. What do you feel you have already that could be packaged like this? Because that would be really interesting brain food to see what you think about. Yeah, in, in the software world, there's there's sort of two um two systems where they um you can have a compiler error that your program um is is uninterpretable by the compiler, but also a um linter error where you where it's like a second pass. And you're like, oh, this technically works, but this looks a little fishy, like um it's the same thing. And it's unfortunate that in the software world, um maybe like miles ahead of of the text uh, writing world. In that sense, so so maybe some of the tools are just some of the tasks are just to uh, steal from the software world uh, um, and give to the uh, literature world. Or well, I mean, imagine because you know we, we also talked a little bit about charts from the documents. So imagine if you are an author and you've written a thing, and one of the reports you get back is a timeline of your document. All it is is a list of dates with the sentences related to it. You know, it's just another way for you to view your document to see if it's coherent. Maybe one thing it is a list of characters. And then you can click to see their relationships, like click on Jane and you see all the sentences Jane has written, been written about Jane in the document. But then if Jane and Bob have been, can't believe I'm using these two particular names, they're our neighbors. Um, if they've been somehow grammatically related, you can see only the sentences with both of them, right? So you, the whole point is the interaction doesn't have to be like a huge screen with lots of buttons. It could be very image mappy, clickable, clickable, clickable. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, some of the um, the, uh, the more frustrating part for me when I'm writing are things, if I move a sentence, um, and then the pronouns get messed up or something or or if you change the tense of a, a verb and then a few words over you need to make it a plural or something um and there's a bunch of links that that would be nice if they if they did automatically yeah i mean for that that's a really good example and i could uh, guess that in some cases you could the system could know which one is the correct tense based on other sentences by it but in some cases they're just contradictory. So when you go through this export checklist, it shows you the sentences that have issues. You can click, yeah. this is the right one, fix the rest or something. Yeah, exactly. But also, um, here, here's a speculative and maybe annoying question. And by the way, when, as a developer, when people say to me, oh, you should do this and that, it gets really annoying. So I hope you won't get too annoyed. <laughs> but, but could uh, what the systems you have look at the document and then ask questions and say what? this seems yeah. to be unresolved or what about this or something's missing here yeah i don't know um yeah it would be it would be a fun uh fun thing to work on i think what about analysis of reading a document where let's say it's an academic document and you know you can do a summary of course and say here are the conclusions and stuff maybe there is a way by learning some of that specific language and say this document fails to take into account or this document doesn't have a section on such and such i like the um the structured abstract that we were discussing before uh yeah related the, to the that. requirements for this document in this format or something yeah yeah i think to spot the missing bit you you have to have you, there has to be some structure for whatever process like you know specialist tools to work within because looking looking for the dark matter is kind of hard otherwise i mean you can say something isn't there but what what isn't there becomes sort of hard to bound whereas if there is some kind of broader well broadly some some kind of metadata uh at least 
uh, describing expectations. I, I, but I would chip in. I, 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 I love the idea, actually, and this is something that sort of NLP and things strikes me probably will be good for is change of tense or change of person. So I mean, I grew up doing public service writing in the Navy. So I, you know, everything was in third person just was <laughs> you learned the hard way that that was it was third person whereas much of the stuff I do now you're you're absolutely sort of shouted at if you write to the third person um so but it I, I reflect on this because it shows how deeply ingrained one one thing becomes so uh, I, and I know when I was writing my own thesis that this was something that I struggled with I, I kept finding I just wandered up you know wandered outside the lines because I was supposed to be writing in this this tense or this person and I just and I just um, wandered off without noticing. Trying to, you know, tr try, trying to mark your own homework is notoriously hard anyway. So having things that can basically detect that chop, because if you know that within a given piece, you would not expect the primary author, for instance, to change their, uh, their tense or their um, person, you know, whether you write it first person or, you know. Um, so I think that that's a really useful application because I, I don't doubt it happens a lot. So follow-up question to you, Spencer. Can you please outline a little bit again what some of the capabilities of the system are, such as changing tense and so on, just to, to help us brain food-wise? Sure. Yeah, the, on the, the first thing um, is, the, is the tokenization step, as in, as in many um, NLP libraries where it splits up words and sentences and punctuation. Um, I mean, that's that sometimes is, is enough, you know, um, there's some like uh, structured lookups you can do with that and indexing and um, and that's that's quite easy, you know, it's just a couple of regular expressions to do that. Um, but the second thing is part of speech taking, which is which is like you said, um, just deciding what thing a word is, if it's a musical group or something like that, or if it's a quick, no. quick question there. Um, yeah. I was wondering about it a couple of days ago. But uh, have you ever tried to write with a visualization of uh, of part of uh, of her PRS uh, tagging going on? Yeah, yeah, it's never been it's never been useful, or it's never been something that makes me a better writer. Uh, yeah, and I, it, it's uh, yeah, it's it's. It, I imagine that those things. Um, how can I put this as an example? It's like at some point you want to abstract things away. Uh, so you know a verb is a verb and then maybe it's not that useful once you have achieved a certain level of mastery um, that yeah, it shows more information, but this information becomes noise. Right. So I'm wondering if though for a, a novel speaker or writer that could be useful, but yeah, I can imagine that it's, uh, yeah, you disable it after a while because it doesn't, yeah, seems to bring value. Well, again, I would say that it's one of those features of a, an assistive environment whose necessity varies with the relative difficulty of what you're doing and how complicated a piece of writing is, for example. So, you know, that using photo photosmography to, to figure out how heavy handed to be with that sort of support. Um, well, I have a friend who's a, a, a principal researcher in neuroscience, and he ends up with the most tangled webs of jargon uh, and long sentences in his his uh, his uh, grant proposals and reports, and uh, and sometimes he'll he'll take me take them to me for debugging. Basically, I mean, he does it with JavaScript as well because it gets terribly messy. Scientists write terrifying code. Um, but uh, with the pros, uh, you know, it, it is actually pretty useful to be able to, I mean, a, a parser would struggle to know exactly which pieces of proteas are, are nouns and which are verbs and whatever. But um, the, the reality is the, the way that I, I pull those things apart is by trying to break it down per sort of clause and subclause in order to be able to say, like, look at all of the work you're trying to do with this one sentence. Is this the order that it really needs to be in? And uh, having having the ability to kind of um, get an, an assistive layer over top of that in order to be able to figure out what are the 
sort of the things that must go together and the order in which they must go. Um, I think that color would probably help in a place where that's really complicated. So yeah, uh, it, it, I think that it, it can be useful, particularly when you when when authors get stuck deciding they need to say everything at once um, and uh, being able to differentiate and disambiguate which which of the pieces are, that are sort of related to which specific goals. Um, two, two quick notes on this. Uh, I know that I, I make sentences that don't make any sense when I tend to re-edit them two or three times in a row. And then I just print send without rereading. So I'm going to miss a verb or something like this. Uh, so I'm wondering if that also could be the level of interaction that could be interesting. And we see that the, let's say the cursor goes back, like the more than a threshold, 50 characters back uh, and adds uh, lots of words. Um, that that could be some interesting uh, some some interesting uh, support, let's say, for the writer, especially if we know that yeah, this is a recurring mistake. Uh, which does lead me to to the question on this is um, one thing is if I understood correctly, NLP compromise the name is uh, or the, the how do you say the heuristic is in the name that uh, it's a compromise. You don't cover every single word ever uttered. Um, but sometimes that's frustrating. Like if I so uh, I invent words uh, and they are not in any dictionary except mine. Uh, so at some point when I write a text, I would want to add it to this. So is there some kind of feedback loop in order to kind of uh, make the vocabulary or some of the patterns grow, even if it's just locally, not necessarily something that somebody would push back, let's say uh, upstream? Yeah, I. Um, the first example when you're uh, with the edit mode where it's like the 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 editor recognizes that you're going back um i love that idea it's like the scrolling mode where where as soon as you enter this it's like the text knows and it's it's uh you're in refactoring mode um i love that yeah um, um in terms of the configuring the the choices and the rules of compromise that, that was like uh that's central you know that's that's um the biggest most important thing is that users can be able to change it you know um um i've gotten in trouble with with people like um it, it's a really sensitive thing to to make judgments about a language you know if you're if you're in in oxford or you're if you're in uh whatever you're um the the decision around languages are are much different and so um um I insist that all the all the decisions about what what words mean and and what words exist and are known and recognized um, are configurable. Um, it's not perfect, um, but but I've taken great lengths to make sure that's possible. And a quick note: I was thinking about the visually highlighting. Uh... POS tags, for example, because I, I think about syntax highlighting when I code uh, and I like it. So it's kind of like bringing me safety, for example, the closing parentheses or finishing, knowing that the coloring is right. And if it doesn't, then I know I missed like a, a comma or some silly things like this. So I'm wondering also at what point that could be useful, maybe not in simple sentence or let's say only highlighting when the something looks off uh, whatever those rules could be like no verb or something like this uh, could be interesting and that also lead me to the little question i put in the chat is uh, one of the uh, code and text editor i use and all of us use all over the web uh, is code mirror so i'm wondering if there are some uh, plugins you're aware of for code mirror using an lp compromise yes i love the code mirror product it's incredible and i've used a i've tried you know, there's a lot of um, WYSIWYG uh, um, attempts. It, it's like like every major company has its own WYSIWYG thing. Um, uh, I think Codemir is the best. Um, and um, it's about how um, saying this, but like how how uh, um, how nuts it is. You know, it, it, um, to get that to work on the web is incredible. Um, it, it's like a one-person project. Um, um, so I so I, I I second your recommendation and I have used it. Um, you know, well, let's talk after if, if you want um, about the plugins for it. Uh, I've tried it a bit. I'm not an expert.
there, there seems to be a difference between when we want interactions and when we don't. And also, when we talk about degrees of freedom, I put it in the chat a while ago, and we I've discussed it in the group, but I think it may be relevant here. And that is, you know, when I play a computer game, I feel I have certain freedom because it's smooth. And then in something like Photoshop that I know intimately, yes, I can do a million shortcuts. But very often, if it is a shortcut, it's like a binary thing. It's like this or that. What we get in virtual reality is what we have in real, real reality. You know, we have this incredible ability to do things. I saw a video on the Tesseract in Interstellar uh, as kind of a visualization device. And the, the thing about VR, you move your head, you move your body and all that stuff. It provides a whole new level of control. And so I'm just wondering if when it comes to text and these kinds of interactions, you know, imagine if you could grab Thursday the 12th. And if you turned it this way, you would go backwards. But you can also expand it. So it's not just the 12th. It starts being a date range. Um, you know, you, you can start... It, physically manipulating it right you can maybe even do a, a pinch out to see anything else in the document or any document that you have that relates to that time right it may be yeah i mean it, it this can go on and on and on and it can seem just like play but i do think we should try to have, have some fun along these lines yeah mark so a reflection on what you just said makes me think that because one of, one of the other sort of transitions that we we seem to be shuffling towards is the fact that you know, to a certain extent, even if it's not written by hand, a lot of what we read or produce sort of works within the metaphor that essentially someone somewhere wrote it down, or we we think within that parameters. We're talking about actually a much more sort of depersonalized. No, that's the wrong word, but but a more disconnected process. So, you know, th 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 there's there's a lot less of this in where are we in camera. You know, a lot less of this involved. And I, I don't. And I don't say that as a bad thing. I don't. I, it's more that there just is a to gain more of the things we're doing. We I think you know we really do need to think about the sort of production method um, because so ma so many of things are very very deeply embedded in sort of human written word uh and as sort of advanced by mechanic me mechanized text which is the print era which we've moved beyond already but we're still very much living in it and the things that we're discussing are definitely not of the print era did we need text in vr is... yes next <laughs> Next, moving on. Next. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I, I, I think I think it bears examination of what what it is that we why we say we need text and what the characteristics that are necessary of text. Um, so, uh, text is you know, uh, and everybody knows this, but I'm going to say all of this anyway. Um, text is a, a visually persistent and scannable representation of ideas of the same kind that we have the ability to render in spoken word, but that doesn't persist. You don't have the ability to look back and forth over it. Um, there are possibilities that sort of flow from being able to put speech in spaces, and I'm excited by that, but text is the only kind of visual structural form that we can use to be able to refer to things. You also can't get a summary of a speech from a speech. You have to look at the text, you have to be able to kind of manipulate it like that. Um, what that means, though, in terms of the sort of the the representation of it, I think, is something that needs to be considered and is up for grabs because there are so many optimizations that text has undergone in the past 2000 years uh, to be optimized for the specific medium that it resides within. And some of those still apply because they are as much to do with our own cognitive cap capabilities as they are to do with the medium. But things like white space, uh, the amount of text that we jam into a specific area is surely optimized more for the benefit of minimizing the number of dead trees and shelf space required than it was for the capacity for human processing. And so those are the kinds of things where we really need to take a serious look at what it is that text does and what it is that we need out of it. Uh, just really quickly before I give over to Fabian, just to continue on what Brendel's saying, and that is, um, I don't know about everyone else, but how I define VR, and I hate the term metaverse, I won't use it other than what I have to, is basically 
everything feels the same as now. You don't feel you have a headset on. So if it's projector based and if it's augmented reality or virtual reality, really isn't the point. The point is that you can use the environment to put lots of information. Imagine you have just traditional posters. And Bob Horn, who was here earlier, he's made some amazing murals that you can instantly make huge and small, which Randall has, has done already, which even that completely static, other than this one thing moves, is an incredibly powerful thing. But I don't think of VR as being kind of a social game space. You go in and it's all a bit neon and all of that stuff. It is reality plus. In 20 years, it will be like that. Next year, it'll be the beginning of that. So that's why I think it is so important that we think about it because the key is the amazingly powerful things we can do in VR. They need the damn metadata. Otherwise, they will remain fantasies. And once they have that, obviously, traditional digital text benefits as well. So as far as I'm concerned, what VR brings to all of us is a new opportunity for curiosity and dreaming. You know, Doug Engelbart's work in the 60s was amazing. Why wasn't he successful later? It's because everybody thought they knew what text and computers are. It's really, really hard to try to make something better when people think they know what it is. So now with VR, that's the huge emotional thing. Sorry for my repeat. That's the important bit for me. Okay, Fabienne. Yes. That's it. No, but uh, jokes aside, if it's to make the same thing as we did before, no, we absolutely don't. Uh, and and honestly, it's the same for VR in general. Like if you if you play soccer in VR, there is no point. If you play soccer, let's say with 0.2 gravity or whatever you want, like it's radically new and different, a new way to interact. And I do think it's at the very least worth exploring. Uh, I gave it very silly, but on the moment uh, example in the chat that I can imagine having text. And then the closer I get, the quote unquote deeper I go in the text. So it just like unfold, but also it shows, let's say, POS text highlighting or definition per word or novel, literally novel way to do it. And, and maybe that's just for the fun of the moment or playing with the text itself. Uh, and never, ever am I going to uh, give up on, on the ink or on uh, just like physical things like books or, or magazines or journals. Um, it's, it's on top of. Uh, and the question still remains like, what are those actually novel use cases where it's just literally better than everything else we had before. And I don't think reading, let's say, a 500-page book, that's not going to be it. Like, I am i don't think so, because we have already books for that. Uh, and they are they don't ever need battery and whatnot. But if it's a, a way to interact, play with the text, transform the text. Uh, I was giving the example, let's say, of when you make a... You change the number of rabbits, let's say, you see the 3D models of them, uh, maybe coupled to a simulation, all, all this where it's just more than what we have. And I, yeah, that's also why I guess it's so challenging for us. Like we have a gut feeling for it. We have at least some guiding principles of true novelty, but not an answer. But although that's also what makes it exciting. Yeah, double indeed. And I'm going to let Roderick have the last words. I just wanted to say on top of Fabian's notion of, you know, having e-ink and such, I love going out with only my Apple Watch and no other electronic devices. You know, it connects me. But sometimes I want to be fully immersed. And to be able to have the choice of minimum, maximum uh, is a big thing. Roderick. Um, I, I don't know if I want the last word because, um, well, let, let me stipulate. Uh, I think text is probably humankind's greatest invention. Um, I mean, it it is what has has permitted us this advancement. The way we are able to uh, to represent and to construct more and more complex and more abstract representations on top of representations and uh, create uh, meta descriptions of. Uh, of the ideas we, we have in our minds. I, I think that's what's um, really powered us to, to where we are today. 
Um, in terms of VR, I, I, I really, in in my in my work on 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 the protocol, I'm, I, I've come to want to make a, a very strong distinction. Text is, I think, one dimensional um, fundamentally, and in in a in a very real sense that. Um, when you when you have a piece of text, if you strip it down to its basics and take away the formatting, um, then what you have has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I I want in the technology to to keep that distinction um, between what text is and what text is for, and between the dimensionality of um, the the spatial computing side of things, because I think if we if we do try to um, do everything with text tools or to do everything with um, spatial tools, we will be compromising one or other to an extent. So that's really the focus of, of my interest here is, is, is that. But I do think I do think in terms of the tech I'm working on, text probably does need to be a first class component rather than something that's um represented in in a, in a sort of secondary way as say three-dimensional shapes of of letters and so on i think text itself should probably be um treated treated as text um in in the in the core of the the, the technology that's where i'm at now with it Yeah, thank you for that. And um, as I just wrote, we are bang on time. And um, thank you, Spencer, very, very much. I think that you have um, broadened our mind, but I think this is just the beginning. I think the more we learn about your work, the more imaginations will be fired. So that's that's wonderful. So I welcome uh, Spencer and Roderick to the group. Thank you for being here today. Please feel free. Uh, should you have the time and the inclination to come back any Monday, any Friday, same time zone, same time uh, Zoom, and also Future of Text 27th, 28th of uh, September. Um, have a good week um, and um, look forward to Friday, guys. Yeah, today's Monday, yeah. right? Yes, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it was just two hour flight, <laughs> I'm a bit muddled today. All right, take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.